for the next portion of the agenda and building, uh, uh, building off of our new department strategic plan, we wanted to give the opportunity to share ways in which our department is taking action and having an impact in the health system as a whole through collaboration uh, with health system leaders across our department and beyond. So I would now like to introduce our chair, Dr. Danielle Martin, to orient us to the work currently being undertaken, and then to introduce our other presenters, moderators, and panelists. Thank you so much, Allison, and I'm uh, thrilled to be with all of you this morning and excited to give you a little bit more flavor uh, of an example of some work that we're doing locally uh, in Toronto region um, around, uh, around health system leadership. Um, it's so uh, exciting and wonderful uh, transitioning from yesterday's conference through Peter's uh, spectacular address this morning to thinking about how do we uh, take all of the academic strengths of this amazing department and bring those to bear on the problems that our health system is facing. Uh, so I have a very small number of slides that I would like to share. Um, I hope that I don't need to convince anyone who is here at our DFCM conference today about why primary care and family medicine matter in the health system. We know that uh, health systems that are uh, based in a solid foundation of primary care and primary health care produce better health outcomes more equitably and at a lower cost to the system. But I think importantly, as we all know, we are struggling in, uh, in Ontario and across Canada and indeed around the world to deliver on that promise of primary health care. Um, and in this period of the, of the, uh, of the pandemic, we are, um, we're experiencing health human resources shortages that are not going to go anyway, uh, not going to go away anytime soon and that require a tremendous amount of creativity. And I think that's where academic expertise and leadership can really help. Here um, in Ontario, we know that attachment levels to uh, comprehensive uh, primary care teams or to family doctors have, uh, are low and have been falling. There are currently 2.2 million Ontarians who don't have a regular family doctor. Um, and in the city of Toronto, uh, in Toronto region where our university is physically located, that translates to about half a million people who don't have access to regular uh, primary care. And uh, of course, those needs are not equitably, equitably distributed with uh, higher rates of uh, poor attachment, loose attachment, or no attachment at all among new uh, Canadians, among people living in low income neighborhoods, and among people who are members of traditionally marginalized communities. And so we really have a, an equity problem and an access problem in primary care, something which we all, of course, know because we spend a lot of our time uh, fielding requests from. Uh, friends, family members, colleagues, co-workers, and our patients to see if we can just take one more person into our practices uh, because people are so overwhelmed. And I want to uh, 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 shout out to uh, Tara Kieran and so many of her colleagues uh, across the province who've been doing work to put numbers to this experience that we all have every day. Here in the city of Toronto, uh, where the university is located, um, there is a significant problem in addition to an absence of attachment to primary care or family medicine uh, with the question of teams. And so, uh, you know, in spite of the fact that we know that there's strong evidence, particularly among um, uh, populations who have greater uh, socioeconomic barriers and other barriers to accessing care uh, for interprofessional teams, uh, the reality is that in the city of Toronto, only 14% of the population is attached to a team. And again, those needs are not equitably distributed with some neighborhoods and some Ontario health teams having higher rates of, of team attachment than others. And, uh, and across the province, I think if one were to take a step back and, and look and say, well, if you were only going to have about a third of Ontarians attached to a team, have we picked the right third? the third who would benefit the most? Um, and the answer is clearly no, which is not to say that everyone doesn't deserve a team, but just that we haven't been planful uh, in the way that we've approached this. And, and this has significant repercussions for people's ability to access, as we know, all parts of the health system. Now, in spite of these uh, depressing statistics and numbers, um, I think it's fair to say that family physicians and primary care teams have been working extremely hard uh, this slide is a very uh, high level summary of some of the important primary care indicators, again, in the city of Toronto and Toronto region with respect to COVID recovery, because we've been hearing a lot and reading a lot about backlogs. 
uh, of services in primary care as well as in our hospitals. And uh, we know, in fact, that in primary care, even though we've seen a doubling of retirements and uh, a lot of people exiting comprehensive uh, family medicine uh, to go into more focused practice models, um, the overall number of primary care visits um, has uh, been uh, as high or higher than they were uh, pre-pandemic. So more work is being done with fewer people. Uh, if you feel like you're working harder, the answer is you are. Uh, pediatric primary care visits as people have tried to catch up on immunizations and well child visits are also up. Um, and we have um, a, a return to pre-pandemic levels across a wide variety of screening and other uh, interventions, whether that's for diabetes, uh, cancer, um, and some vaccines. And so uh, this is not to say that primary care is performing beautifully. And I would say that I think we all know that our pre-pandemic levels were not where we wished that they would be if we were delivering a really high reliable, highly reliable, um, uh, high quality primary care across the, uh, across the city and across the province. But just to say uh, that actually a lot of work has been done in the so-called catch up. Um, and, uh, and so we are, uh, you all, are to be congratulated uh, for that amazing work. And um, I'm presenting Toronto data here because I'm leading up to a Toronto story, uh, but indeed these numbers are not, uh, are not dissimilar in other parts of the province. This brings us then to uh, what are we going to do as a department and as a, uh, as a society to deal with the critical needs in primary care right now. Many of you will have seen that uh, the province of Ontario announced a small expansion in uh, interprofessional team-based care, $30 million investment. Um, I feel comfortable and confident to share with you that I think that we need probably um, 10 times that. Um, we probably need close to a billion dollar investment in primary care, uh, in my opinion, in Ontario to get us to where we need to be. But we'll take the 30 million uh, for new interprofessional teams. And we know that those teams uh, can go into places where they're sorely needed to address access uh, and attachment uh, challenges. Um, so we, we need to see those system, system investments. And we have seen a commitment from the federal government uh, in the form of the uh, increase to the Canada Health transfer payments, and importantly, a set of bilateral agreements with the, each province and territory, so an agreement signed by the federal government with each province and territory to invest very significant amounts of money over the coming years into healthcare, and the very first area of focus named is so-called family health care. That's primary care, and, uh, and we're thrilled to see that commitment, and so uh, the question is how can we support our provincial government in figuring out how to invest those dollars wisely to get the outcomes that we all want that we started out this talk with uh, better uh, better outcomes better equity and uh, and lower overall system costs so those system investments are part of it partnerships and integration um, between the community the hospital setting the home the long-term care facility, all of the many places where family doctors take care of patients um, is critically important. The conversation about data, which we heard Peter speak to in his talk and the future of primary care data infrastructure. Uh, conversations about human resources. What do we mean when we say teams? What kind of team? How many? What kinds of uh, flavors of workers should be on those teams? What services should they be providing? How can we um, use teams effectively to improve access for people? Attacking administrative burden, I know this is something that is near and dear to the hearts of so many of our uh, of our faculty members and learners wanting to make sure that we're spending as much time as possible taking care of people, and that where we have to do administrative work, it feels like administrative work for a reason, for a purpose, because it's part of our job, uh, not because it's make work or duplicative work or work that makes no sense. The adoption of added value, uh, digital health offerings. So how can we make sure that technology is actually supporting our goals of taking care of patients? And again, access to data so that we can be continuously improving the work that we're doing, not just saying, well, you know, okay is good enough. So these are the critical needs. And the question is, how do we get in on the action of deciding and, uh, and uh, developing uh, the ways that we, uh, we address these needs? And our answer to that in our department is the Office of Health System Partnership, which we launched in 2022. And it really is, the goal of this office is really to provide leadership at the local level, at the provincial and national levels, and also at the global level um, uh, under the leadership of Catherine Rouleau, really working on thinking about how do we bring together 
what we do on the international scale in DFCM, for example, through our WHO collaborating center with the work that's happening locally to strengthen primary, primary health care. And so finally, uh, just to say that this work, uh, and we'll talk about it now more as I hand to my ca uh, colleague Catherine Yu to introduce some of the members of the local OHSP team that are doing work here uh, in the city of Toronto uh, with our, our uh, Ontario Health Region. This is, to me, one of the most critical uh, pieces of the strategic plan. I've heard over and over, uh, as Stu Murdoch was saying to me yesterday at the, uh, at the in-person conference, you know, we can do all of these things in education, that's great, but if somebody doesn't fix the health system, we're not gonna be able to graduate uh, learners who uh, will cherish a career in family medicine, which is of course what we want. And so we need to be doing with, uh, with one hand, our work in education and research, and with the other hand, this work in leadership to fix the system so that we are not uh, graduating uh, learners and trainees and having them fall off a conveyor belt into a dysfunctional place. And, uh, and I believe strongly that academic family medicine can lead in that, uh, in that space, uh, which is the reason behind the launch of the OHSP. And so we're going to talk a little bit now about an example of the OHSP's work in the local Toronto region, understanding that of course DFCM spans much more than the city of Toronto, but we, uh, we do have this inaugural partnership with Ontario Health that we're really excited about to begin to provide uh, primary care leadership in the region and take all the incredibly smart people we have in this department and put their brains on the problems of the day uh, to see if we can be more effective in, in supporting the system to, uh, to achieve our goals with respect to primary care. And so with that, I'm going to hand to my, uh, my cherished colleague, Catherine Yu, uh, the engagement lead in the OHSP, um, and who works alongside Tara Kieran, myself, and the whole OHSP team to talk a little bit about uh, this local work. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks for that, Danielle. Yeah. So I, I um, just actually, sorry, the, those are my slides. We'll just share my slides here, I think. Give me a moment. I do have the honor of introducing our next speaker for our session today, um, but before I do so, allow, allow me to walk you through a very brief interlude. I also have the honor of um, introducing the rest of our panelists, um, but if you give me one more minute, I will just share my slide with you. There you go. Okay, um, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that um, what you're seeing in your screens right now is a screen on health systems leadership, advocacy and action. Yes? Yep. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I, again, a very brief interlude. So first a shout out to the inaugural OHSP team. It's been a real pleasure building this plane with you while flying it, so to speak. Um, and I, I want to just acknowledge that as we build this plane, I, I do think of a few notable health systems leaders that have helped carve our path for us. And I note that a few of them have joined us in this webinar today. So just wanted to say that our work is truly around building off uh, or building on previous work that has been done. Um, special thanks here to um, my colleague, Dr. Rosemary Law, who has been co-leading the Toronto Regional Operational Leadership Team with me um, since it, in a, its inception in October 2022. And I, I wanted just to walk us through to think about situating ourselves as family doctors and faculty in our working through the health systems leadership space. So just an analogy, along with some reflections to try and answer the question, what is the OHSP and where might we be headed? Uh, I have spent the first 10 years of my um, career um, in the ER and I was always in awe during my ER days um, and how it didn't matter. Whichever ER I worked at, there were always team members to respond to a code blue. How remarkable it was to have the teams of doctors, nurses, and allied health supports all know exactly what their roles were when a patient was in distress. As everyone arrives in response to a code blue, there would usually be chaos at the start, then a rhythmic calm usually ensues where individuals slip into their roles and they have such clarity on their tasks. 
you may have heard one of our notable DFCM faculty members, Dr. Yoel Abels, who has been doing health systems leadership work for many years, say the following. Primary care is not just in crisis, but it is in life support. I think about that every day as I work through our Ontario health system, our healthcare system response. And I think about, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a system in place where as we press the code blue button on primary care, we have a whole network of health systems leaders and primary care network champions who include many, if not all of us to work on fixing the system. In my mind, this is the work that the OHSB can help support and power up. Primary care practitioners, we are probably the best place to grow health systems leaders because we are often tasked with solving infinite number of possible issues in our clinical practice, and we have mastered the implementation of solutions over and over and over. My last slide, of the many different ways that the OHSP can evolve into, I am most excited about the infinite possibilities of bridging the no-do gap in establishing integrated care systems. I hope that as you hear from our next speaker and the rest of our panelists today, you can think of where you might situate yourselves in the super connected web that we need to weave to move mountains on behalf of our patients and our healthcare system. Of late, despite the crisis upon us, I have become more op optimistic as I have been convinced without a doubt that our health system partners are truly with us in this distributed leadership journey. Through this DFCM OH partnership and together as family practitioners, I do believe, I truly believe that we can move from advocacy into action. So with further, without further ado, I am pleased to introduce our next speaker for this session. Um, you know, as an engage as the engagement lead, figuring out what the who does what and who has levers to pull the and solve systems issues with us was the first order of business. And I am grateful that Rose Cook, our VP Clinical Programs in Ontario Health Toronto Region, has kindly agreed to walk us through the supportive structures that we are all working within as we work with our colleagues in Ontario Health. Over to you, Rose. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, and thanks very much for having me. Very excited to share with you some further information about Ontario Health, hopefully kind of uh, providing a bit more clarity uh, into what can sometimes be a bit of a confusing landscape of government crown or agencies and uh, and lots of different tables. So um, happy to uh, happy to share some uh, some more information today. If we go to the next slide. Um, I'll let you know that I'm going to share today uh, some information specific about Ontario Health, uh, who we are, what we do, uh, specifically within the primary care context. I'm also going to talk about how we do our work um, with a specific focus on engaging and leveraging uh, clinical input expertise and the clinical leaders who are so very instrumental to helping us work towards our shared goals. Let me go to the next slide. We'll get into the thick of things. So Ontario Health uh, came together in 2019. It is the amalgamation of 22 formerly separate entities, uh, many noted in the circle, in the diagram, and hopefully it's big enough to see. Um, many of you may remember uh, pre-Ontario Health, you may have heard of or dealt separately with organizations like the Toronto Central Lynn, uh, Health Quality Ontario, Cancer Care, Ontario eHealth, uh, to name a few. Uh, collectively now, all of us combined uh, are continuing to build on those same standards of excellence and the global recognition developed by a lot of those existing agencies prior to amalgamation. But now as Ontario Health, our aim as an organization is to coordinate and to connect Ontario Health, Ontario's healthcare system, um, really making it more efficient, uh, where we know there's uh, still inefficiencies and in supporting the delivery of best possible patient care. And that includes supporting a very local approach to healthcare, building on the relationships um, in neighborhoods while offering a high standard of care to clients across the region. We go to the next slide. I'll let you know about Toronto region. Uh, we are one of six Ontario health regions that link communities and provider partners together. We have staff teams in these regions that help to make sure that health system resources and supports uh, go, where they, go where they best meet needs um, of people across the province 
uh, again, taking a very local community-based approach. Uh, the focus within each region is to work with our local communities, our local healthcare providers, and other partners to improve the patient experience, the provider experience, with a big focus on population health outcomes and achieving better value. The next slide is um, a, <laughs> it's a bit of a visual to help orient you to a little bit um, of how Ontario Health is organized. Uh, really intending to give you a bit of a sense of some of the provincial functions that, that exist, but also the regional functions and how we work together. So um, as I mentioned, each region is really working to support local delivery that's enabled by an integrated backbone of provincial programs. Um, supporting evidence-based um, evidence standards for population health, for clinical services, digital quality standards across the system. Um, those, those provincial functions you can see on the lower part of the screen um, articulate all of the various kind of facets and, and pieces of Ontario health in that provincial infrastructure. At the top are the regions, and, and regionally we are about supporting implementation of health system change and quality improvement. Uh, we do a lot around capacity planning and analytics. Uh, we support funding allocation. I'll talk about funding later, but we support the allocation and distribution of funding, performance measurement, management. And, and I think uh, one of the most important pieces is really supporting regional coordination of programs across sector. Um, and I think that's the integrating role that we play. We have a big focus on patient access, uh, equity, uh, things that Danielle has already mentioned, um, and integration and flow. The next slide, another fun one. So it's a bit busy, uh, but I hopefully you have these to take home and, and look at later. But I did wanna illustrate with this slide the connections between so many different but key players uh, in the primary care landscape. I'm going to focus largely on the left side um, of the screen, that interplay between Ontario Health and the Ministry of Health. But again, encourage you to look at all of the boxes uh, to help kind of connect the dots to all of the pieces and the tables and the players. Each year, Ontario Health receives a mandate letter from the Ministry of Health. And that in that letter, it really outlines the instructions to Ontario Health regarding key health system transformation goals, uh, strategic priorities, ongoing priorities, and operational management initiatives. And those are the things that Ontario Health has to deliver on. For primary care, what that mandate is uh, pertains to supporting the involvement of primary care providers within OHTs, uh, providing enhanced oversight and performance management of interprofessional primary care linked to those OHTs, uh, developing an aligned health human resources plan that will help stabilize and rebuild the healthcare workforce, um, as well as a focus on developing and implementing a chronic disease strategy, this year focusing specifically on diabetes, but also integrating a disease prevention lens in all of the clinical activities too, and all the cl clinical activities that we do. The ministry's role by and large setting legislation, policy, and direction to the health system. And our role in Ontario Health is really to execute and deliver on that for the government. The government also sets out the funding available for provincial priorities, including primary care, which we execute on. Um, and lastly, I'll say that another key role for the ministry is that of the primary relationship holder with the OMA. Uh, and that includes any and all no negotiations with the OMA. Ontario Health will provide uh, input uh, uh, into the ministry's uh, thinking, but they lead and stick handle all of those discussions and negotiations largely. So you'll note for Ontario Health that there, there is a delineation here on this slide between our provincial programs and our regional teams. I would call out that in fact, we are one big happy family and we are one team at Ontario Health, but there's lots of players that help to deliver on all of those accountabilities that I just referenced. Um, and in, in the regions and in Toronto, we have a small but mighty staff team that supports the work on the ground. Um, and I would say that all regions do have increased bench strength with designated primary care clinical leads that lend expertise, their advice, and they partner with the regional uh, teams to really drive local work. In Toronto, 
uh, we've taken a slightly different approach than other regions who have contracted individually uh, with folks to be their primary care, their designated primary care lead. In Toronto, we've partnered with DFCM to be our primary care leaders, which I would say is uh, an innovative and very exciting approach to clinical leadership. Uh, lastly, what I'll note on this slide um, is that um, provincially, uh, all regions with their designated primary care leads, they come together with Dr. Liz Mugga, who is our provincial um, primary care lead, um, and they come together to ensure coordination across the province on executing um, our primary care strategy. And that's that yellow box, uh, uh, yellow lined box that you see on the right. We are so fortunate to have our DFCM leaders, Dr. Danielle Martin and Dr. Catherine Yu, representing Toronto on that at that provincial level, really helping to inform and shape the work with other, other key primary care leaders across the province. And below that, the blue blocks with the uh, with the pink lining uh, is our Toronto focused tables, really looking at um, operations, but also strategy. Uh, and we lead that in partnership with DFCM to serve as forums for coming together with primary care leaders across the region uh, to listen and to learn, um, to hear firsthand what's happening in the field, as well as to plan and to chart a course for our local work. We want to go to the next slide. Now that I've covered off kind of who we are and, and how we do our work, um, I'll shift to what we are doing, uh, focusing on first our vision. Uh, so at Ontario Health, our vision for primary care uh, in Ontario and the province really sees people um, uh, across the province having equitable, high quality team-based primary care that's part of an integrated uh, system that's rooted in communities focusing on the communities and the patients that reside within them. The next slide really drills down um, below that vision um, to share a little bit more about our Ontario Health primary care strategy. And I specifically on this slide wanted, it's another busy slide, my apologies. Uh, I wanted to, to call out the three main strategic objectives uh, for us. First, uh, connecting and integrating primary care within OHTs. The second is looking at stabilizing and expanding capacity and access to comprehensive primary care. And the third is looking at measurement and really optimizing the quality, the equity and performance of primary care um, across the province and within each region. Um, and as I mentioned, Dr. Liz Mugga, who's the provincial lead and her team, she works across and with all of our regions to help drive this strategy forward and, and ensuring that we're all collectively advancing these, these three strategic goals in each region as part of a larger provincial approach and plan. Next slide. In Toronto region, the strategic objectives that I just mentioned are our strategic objectives. As I've said, you know, we're all aligned. Um, our goal is really to strengthen primary care as the foundation uh, of our system to deliver high quality, equitable, integrated team-based comprehensive care um, that's organized, community-based, patient-focused. Uh, in Toronto, there are three main areas that we're focusing our energy on this year in partnership with DFCM. The first is on uh, local health human resources. Uh, looking at integrating primary care leadership into OHT governance models and spreading clinical models that integrate and support primary care generally. Another big area for us is focusing on primary care attachment rates, especially though for those who need it the most. Um, this also includes looking at finding ways to improve efficiency and reducing um, what Danielle has already mentioned and highlights, highlighted a lot of the administrative burden um, that is felt by family docs. Um, and finally, looking at supporting data and indicators at both an individual um, and OHT level in order to support uh, continued identification of local opportunities uh, for improvement. As we do embark on this work, we know that none of it is possible without strong primary care engagement uh, and cross-sectoral partnerships. And I think engagement really underpins all of this work um, and it will be done with leaders and clinicians like yourselves. Uh, our partner, our partnering with DFCM has enabled us to now have uh, a broader scope of, 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 of hearing from the field, gathering clinical insights about the needs, where there are opportunities, um, and where there are ways for us to work together to find and build innovative solutions to some of those, um, those big, gnarly problems. 
we go to the next slide. So the high level map of our work for 23-24, as I just shared, it I wanted to call out that it doesn't stand alone. Uh, it is in part evolved from many years of work that have been undertaken in primary care by so many great leaders here in Toronto. Um, and I imagine many are on this call today. Um, this slide only references a sliver of the work that's been done over the years, uh, like our health links work, um, TFM, Jocelyn Charles, really helping to champion and um, set the foundation for a lot of that work in Toronto. I think about the work of SCOPE, uh, now a critical and key piece of infrastructure in primary care for Toronto, spearheaded and led uh, in large part by Dr. Pauline Pariser. And I also think about, and I've been with OH in the Lind for a while, uh, you know, the very first group of primary care leads in the Toronto Central Lind, uh, Curtis Hanford, Yoel, Abels, um, Nicole, Nitty, Jocelyn Charles, um, Pauline Pariser, and um, Jordi Fallis. So all of those, I believe, are members of DFCM, and they've helped Toronto charge ahead with identifying issues from the field raising them up and really helping to drive regional solutions. There are many big hard problems that remain um, and we have an opportunity to continue advancing and evolving this work um, with existing partners and new partners. I think over this past year, our partnership with DFCM has really enabled us to focus on these bigger pieces of work building on this foundational work um, and the commitment of so many of you and primary care leaders in the field. Next and last slide. Um, so the work of the past, the work of the future, it all requires uh, clinical leadership. Uh, Ontario Health, we are a clinical organization. We recognize the value and the importance of embedding clinical leadership into all aspects of our work at every level. Very excited about our partnership with DFCM and its cadre of existing and emerging leaders and the work that all of you are doing to continue to cultivate new leaders. Um, the expertise, the experience, the insights and the passion, passion that all of you bring to improving the system is so critical of the work that we're going to continue to undertake together. But I would say beyond the DFC, DFCM partnership, there are a range of other clinical leaders that are essential to helping all of us lead the way. We have leaders in OHTs, we have leaders um, within emerging primary care networks, leaders within every clinic, family health team, CHC, any primary care practitioner who makes the conscious choice to, to raise up a hand, to sit on a committee, a working group, to be involved in the work that touches the system. And I think the, the last thing that I'll say before I close out is that um, primary care is a critical uh, component to helping inform, to shape and co-design and really advance our shared agenda and our shared work in primary care. And I'm just, I'm very excited. Our whole OHT team, our OH Toronto team uh, and is very excited about continuing our strong partnership with DF, DFCM to help us lead in addressing a lot of the problems that primary care is facing looking at leveraging opportunities and truly making a difference in Toronto. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. As I look through the past several years of being in health system leadership, truly I am seeing quite a wonderful evolution of the structures that show us the commitment of um, um, the provincial government to primary care. I have worked in, in the context of the TC Lin in the past is, and now seeing what OH has to offer in terms of the commitments to primary care has been um, a, a quite a positive um, evolution and shift. Um, I wanna introduce our um, moderator for our panel today, um, Dr. Rosemary Lal, who's been a dear colleague and friend over the past several months. Um, we're new friends, but have gotten to be thick as thieves in this work. Um, I thank you, Rosemary, um, as, a, as a leader in your OHT and the Scarborough um, Health Network in particular, I, I think we've shared a lot of the challenges and joys of, of um, uh, building the plane and flying it too. Please do take it away for this panel today. Um, and for folks just to remember that if you have any questions, um, please do type them into the Q&A box. I did see some hands up earlier and um, we will be moderating that Q&A. Um, uh, window and, and and put your questions forward as they come. Go, 
Go ahead, Rosemary. Thank you so much, Catherine, and, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to be moderating this uh, really important discussion. I think what I'd like to do first is um, just welcome our panelists and um, start with a roundtable introduction. Um, if you could please state your name, what your name's on the chat, but your position and explain your role briefly. I'm just going to call out the names as I see them, um, just to avoid those awkward silences that happen. Um, all right, so um, I am going to call out Raj because I see you next. Thank you so much, Raj. Thanks, Rosemary. I'm uh, Raj Gudari. I'm a family physician uh, at St. Michael's Hospital uh, Family Health Team in Toronto. And I've just renamed myself uh, and the Zoom as well and the digital health uh, lead um, in the Office of Health System Partnership. Okay, that's great. Ryan, I see you next. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Ryan Bannock. I'm a family physician in the Northwest OHT in the Jane and Finch neighborhood. The office is lead for our partnership, and that basically means uh, working on any partnership to really advance um, having our new grads and actually all family physicians stay in comprehensive primary care and just thinking about solutions in the system or maybe new solutions outside the system to really help new grads, existing practicing physicians with the burdens of family uh, practice in 2023. Ryan, such a critical role. And if anyone has any great ideas or any ideas, please put them in the chat because I think we all need help to come up with solutions. Avnish, I'm gonna ask you next, please. Sure, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Avnish Mehta. Uh, I'm a family physician in Scarborough. Uh, I work at a community health center uh, and I am the uh, attachment lead uh, for the Department of Family and Community Medicine. So that role is we're really looking at attachment strategies um around uh throughout the region and actually beyond uh, and seeing how we can uh we can bring them into our area how we can scale them and how we can improve attachment uh in our region so uh, yeah and I'm, I'm excited to hear everyone's ideas welcome avnish um okay and last but not least noah thank you uh screen on Hi everyone, I'm Noah Ivers. I'm a, a dad of sporty kids and frequently at arenas or fields. Uh, some of the time I'm a family doc and the rest of the time I do applied health research, um, which um, I will talk more about, I think shortly. Okay, great. Um, so I think the first question is, we're gonna speak about opportunities. Uh, challenges may be next, but let's keep it positive. Uh, and Catherine, I'm going to point to you. Um, what opportunities do you see for family doctors to drive change? Um, and I think specifically in our role as members of DFCM, how can we create positive and productive changes in our healthcare system? Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for the question, Rosemary. And maybe I'll, I'll start by acknowledging that I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Peter Selvi's lecture today. Uh, um, the idea around us as BFCM faculty and being researchers and, and doing scholarly work um, it is um, something near and dear to all of our hearts, I believe. Um, and I think that um, just uh, I'll, at a high level, I, I do want to say that one of the slides that really stuck to me when he was presenting was that slide around, well, what do we do about all this research? Um, I'd love to be able to, as, as um, faculty members and, and um, as myself included, translate the research that's out there, what we know, to implementable solutions, actually doing what the, the, the right thing for our system is. Um, Maybe I could just dive a little bit deeper so that it's more relatable in terms of what this might look like as clinical teachers and as administrators. Um, so many of us are clinical teachers. We do bedside teaching on a regular basis. And what might health systems leadership look in that context? Um, I mean, we are always looking um, to, we, we are always facing barriers as family doctors, even as simple as referral pathways where we're referring our patients to the appropriate or much needed services. Um, we might bump into a situation where it'll take three months, five months or 10 months for our clients to actually be seen. And what does, to me, health system leadership look like in that space? 
Um, it may be that as I have a medical student with me, I, I, and I do, I roll my eyes and go, oh my gosh, 10 months to get seen. But it might also mean that I pick up the phone and, and call a colleague in it, who has levers to actually try and figure out with us what those referral pathways are and you know, could we have a centralized referral pathway so that we actually figure out that even though it's 10 months for Dr. So-and-so to see that knee issue, it's actually two months for Dr. So-and-so to see that other knee issue. So it may be a small leadership um, step, but it does, the, these ideas that get heard can actually be translated into solutions. And I'd love for my medical students as I'm doing clinical teaching to see that kind of modeling of health systems work. Um, and not to take up all the airtime, but want to just also put into context what we could do as administrators and leaders. And um, is that one of the ideas I actually was speaking to Dr. Catherine Wayman about this yesterday. Um, she's, by the way, our OHSP educational lead. You know, we do have administrative hats. And, and can we um, actually fly different ways of doing our teaching um, so that our students have the opportunity to shadow us, not only as clinicians um, treating patients, uh, but also as administrators. So wouldn't it be great to have um, a, a medical student sit with us in the half day that we're perhaps sitting in um, health systems leadership meetings? problem solving the health systems level. And at that, in that space, be able to share with them, debrief with them around what is it that we're trying to do here? And how are we engaging as a family doctor in that space to help influence uh, um, policy or, or ways of doing within that space? Um, so those are just some of um, my ideas. Um, I do think that, um, uh, uh, that um, OH um, has been a great space through our DFCM OH partnership um, for us to actually identify the areas that we can provide health system solution advice on and implementation um, work within. So I'm going to maybe ask Rose if that's okay um, to help me answer this question, particularly Rose, um, would you um, uh, perhaps share, you did share at a high level what um, some of the areas are and opportunities for us to lead as family doctors. But I'd love to actually hear um, from you if you do have a, a wish list, perhaps it's a short wish list or a big wish list of more um, opportunities for us to really lean into as the Toronto region um, work, uh, shared work that we're doing together. Yeah, thanks very much, Catherine. Um, I think what you just touched on is um, is amazing. Um, you know, I. Uh, while you were while you were chatting, I was thinking about um, you know it's a reference that I think I made earlier. You know, there's there's kind of the formal roles of health system leadership when you know you're on a committee and you're you know you know giving your your perspective and, and system view. But I think you know health system leadership really needs to be driven in the day to day. To your point about finding some of those ways to um, to broaden folks' perspective around opportunities to influence and, and do things differently within the system. And I think about some of the day to day work at a practice level. You know something as simple as making regular kind of health system updates and you know part of a part of team meetings you know helping to create some of that situational awareness um, around things that are happening in the systems the creative solutions that are being driven and thought you know, thought about and driven in the solutions uh, so in the system um you know i think that that's a really great way of getting new and prospective leaders thinking about system issues and enticing them to be want to to want to be part of of kind of this larger solution making that we're all um working together on you know of course there's there's from you know wearing my oh system hat i think there's lots of different types of opportunities um now and with uh, ohts and and when i talk about one of the roles of of Ontario Health and helping to integrate primary care into into those OHTs, there's going to be lots of opportunities for um, for existing, new, and emerging leaders to help um, uh, lean in um, and provide strong voice, um, perspective, um, and input into a lot of the foundational work that's going to be happening in that space, um, as well as helping to. Um, um, drive some of the solutions. So I think those are a few of the things that come to mind for me. 
Thank you so much, Rose. And uh, it's nice to feel that OH is listening to family doctors. I think that makes us feel encouraged. Um, so I'm actually going to call out on Raj and Avnish to take the next question. Um, since joining the DFCM OHSP partnership, can you share uh, some of the portfolio specific challenges and successes that you've had um, and touched on so far? So. I'll ask Raj to go first, and after Raj, if he could pass the mic over to Avnish. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rosemary. Um, I hope you can see me uh, despite my blue shirt on the blue background, uh, which was an oversight on my part. Uh, so I, I will say that, um, and I, I didn't really say much about my portfolio when I introduced myself, but just uh, I'll briefly summarize it by saying that um, I, I try to help uh, solve challenges that face uh, family physicians in primary care uh, that relate to the technology, the information technology that we're using on a, on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, honestly, one of the biggest challenges that, um, that, that I faced in this role is just um, deciding where to focus uh, our efforts. And, um, you know, I think it doesn't take long for us to generate a long list of problems that we have with with digital uh, and IT in our in our daily work lives, um, but you know I think we have to think about where is the OHSP uh, and the DFCM and, and OH Toronto region positioned to make a positive change, uh, and so I, I think that that's been a, a challenge, um, but I think we've we've been able to address and overcome that challenge um, by engaging you know a large group of multiple stakeholders from across the the DFCM. Uh, different family physicians, uh, as well as stakeholders from uh, Ontario Health Toronto region and Ontario MD, um, and, and actually patient stakeholders as well, uh, to try to to figure out you know, where should we really be putting our our efforts. Um, you know, I, I think another another issue is like every year there seems to be a new uh, or several new digital health uh, priorities that that are coming out and um you know last year it was online booking this year it's it's e-referral um and so i think it's uh, part of it is just uh figuring out how can how can we help primary care uh manage uh do change management with with multiple it initiatives coming at once and you know how can we also tell the people you know that are that are that are pushing these out like you know like maybe we should just uh, uh, hold on and, and focus on on finishing implementation of, of one thing uh, before we jump on to another thing. Um, so, you know, those, those are some of the challenges that that um, that I faced in, in my role. Um, did you want me to talk about successes now or should you want me to hand it over to Avnish first to talk about challenges, Rosemary? I'm just looking at the time, perhaps Avnish, uh, why don't you chat and if we have a little bit more time successes or if we're running out of time, um, if you could type it in. But uh, Raj, your portfolio, again, all of these are so critically important because EMR burnout um, is, is one of the reasons physicians are throwing up their hands and leaving. So um, perhaps chat, put in the chat. I wanna make sure that all the panelists have time to speak, Avnish. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks George Marie. Uh, and thanks Raj. You know, it's interesting. So I think a lot of those challenges affect uh, that, that you mentioned uh, to family doctors do affect uh, attachment. But let me talk about my role in particular. So some of the challenges, I think the biggest challenge has been is uh, the reality is we have a bit of a fragmented approach towards attachment. And to be fair, it's probably a good challenge to have in that many organizations, many groups uh, are actively interested in attachment and trying to improve attachment. So we don't necessarily have a coordinated approach thus far. Um, and, um, you know, for the interest of time, I would say that that is the biggest challenge is just the fragmented approach we're trying to put together. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just talk briefly, uh, Rosemary, about some of the successes uh, before I pass it on. So in terms of successes, it's actually that, that a lot of groups are working on attachment. It is a, an active issue at uh, many tables. Uh, it's constantly being discussed and a lot of people are putting a lot of effort uh, and uh, a lot of and starting to uh, put a lot of resources into attachment. Uh, so we're putting together a report to show some of the different attachment strategies going on in our region. And the hope is uh, to share that uh, and then people can take uh, some of those strategies and hopefully uh, scale them and spread them. Uh, that would be uh, that would be the goal. Awesome. That's great. Um, Raj, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rosemary. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think some of the successes that that we've had 
so far are, are getting engagements, uh, both from primary care uh, physicians as well as uh, from uh, government um, and, um, and, and other stakeholders as, as well. Uh, and so we've, we've set up a digital health committee and the DFCM that, that not only includes a DFCM faculty, but includes representatives from all the, the eight OHTs in Toronto region, as well as representatives from Ontario Health, the Toronto region and, um, Ontario MD. Uh, and so I, I think, uh, you know, at, this is the kind of, uh, table where we can, uh, bring problems and, come up with, I think, some creative solutions. I think we can also uh, sort of distill down, like, you know, addressing that challenge, like, like what's important now? What can we, what can we probably solve uh, in the short term? And, and what's, you know, what can we work on for the longer term? Uh, that table has been super helpful in, in helping to, to clarify some of that stuff. It also is super helpful for, for implementation as well. Like, um, you know, we have other challenges around, like, you know, just building a community of practice for, for digital health, like, um, you know, if someone just wants to implement a new tool in their practice uh, or is using a tool now and wants to get feedback on how they could be using it better, like that's just, that's a table where where we can address those things, too. Um, so I, I think uh, maybe I'll stop there. Rosemary, as far as successes, Thank there's you. good buy-in. There's really good buy-in. Yes, no, and, and I really love the fact that you're reaching out to all the areas to making sure, sure that every EMR user has a representation um, and you know lots of different practice styles. Um, Noah, I'm going to uh, ask you what your successes have been, just because we're really doing well for time. Everyone has been succinct in their answers, and so um, I'm I'm going to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, oh, geez. Okay, my successes. Uh, I don't so know. Great. It all feels like a work in progress. Um, so uh, just just. To step back a bit, my role at the OHSP is, uh, I think, something like scientific lead or some such title. Um, you know, for 15 odd years, I've been doing applied health services research, which nowadays we call implementation science, which is something like, you know, a mix of quality improvement and health services research. And uh, for the last decade or so, I've consistently done things in partnership with Ontario Health. Because, uh, you know, like why, why do you become a health services research, uh, researcher? It's because you want to try to, you know, improve health services. And like, who's responsible for that in Ontario? Um, well, previously HQO and now OH. Um, and so, you know, like as a family doc, I think we know that we, we live it day to day. We live how... Um, you know, the, 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 the policies and practices that are decided at the sort of provincial level affect our day-to-day -day life with our patients. And if we can, you know, touch that with our research, you know, we can potentially impact, you know, like magnitudes more patients than we can touch uh, and help on a day-to-day -day basis in our clinic. So that's like, that's the motivator. Um, and it's the same motivator to keep doing this work with the OHSP. Um, and so I think to the extent that we can bring evidence to bear, as well as our on the ground experience, like that combination in making the policy decisions really, you know, I think puts us in good stead for, you know, trying to, trying to shift things in, you know, what we would all agree is the right direction, um, trying to find ways that increase access and attachment that are informed by successes in the GTA, but also around the world. Um, and then finding ways to like, you know, fit that into the constraints and the policy sort of situation that we have here. Um, so I think, I think I'd summarize our success as like, you know, having that open dialogue about like what it means to bring evidence to bear as well as our experience and fitting it into, you know, finding ways to make, you know, make that work in our context. That feels like a success. That feels like what a learning health system should be. Absolutely, Noah, thank you so much. And um, Brian, I'm gonna pass it over to you to maybe um, speak to some of the successes you've had in your position so far. If you can, again, remind the, um, the group what you're doing and then talk to your successes, thank you. So again, I'm the Health Human Resources Lead in this partnership. 
And I'm going to quickly share two successes that we've had in the past couple months. So the first one is, well, let me give you some background. Um, when I started this position, I actually had time and had a lot of meetings with a lot of colleagues to see a, what's really going on, what are the concerns from your colleagues in primary care, what are we hearing on the ground, what are we hearing from residents, what are you hearing from medical students. And the biggest thing that we are hearing from our colleagues in the field is, when we need a break, we can't take a break. We can't find a locum. There's no one to cover our practice. So even if we want to stay in comprehensive family medicine, if there's no one to help us out, everyone needs a break sometime, you know, it's really hard to stay. So we put together a locum uh, working group and actually ended up putting up a locum job board that's posted up on the UFT site. This is unique and it's different from other job posting out there because this is unique to comprehensive family medicine job posts, so twofold. Number one, we want our colleagues in the community to have a place where they can go and post for a comprehensive family medicine job post, where early in practice grads, new grads, quite frankly, anyone can come and take a look. And what we've also done is try and set some parameters around job posting, so we're not actually competing with ourselves for these few locums that are out there. Um, as well, we gave some guidance to people who are looking for a locum about how to optimize your locum experience um, so that it's a good fit for you and a good fit for the locum. For the person who's going to be filling the locum, we've also provided some guidance and advice out there around how to choose a locum, how to get experience to different parts of our um, different landscapes, different um, practice models, and really what to make of your locum. And we're really hoping by allowing, or I should say, um, prioritizing this opportunity for our new grads that they can see the diverse aspects in the Toronto region of different areas to practice in family medicine, be it different family practice teams, family health organizations, foes, different parts of the city, CHCs, and really get a breadth of knowledge about our healthcare system and where they want to settle down. And hopefully this will encourage them through positive mentorship to actually do comprehensive family practice themselves. The second success um, that is about to be rolled out, it's called our FM CLIO. So that actually stands for the uh, Family Medicine Community Longitudinal Leadership Enrichment Opportunity. So this is a project where we're actually um, really crossing lines in our healthcare system and so, in um, light of our new DFCM plan. So we're really engaging learners and helping with health system recovery. So we're basically running a pilot this year. We've reenacted a family medicine interest week at the uh, U of T, which will be an optional week for students at the end of first or second year medical school. And we're basically engaging these students and we're pairing them with preceptors out in the community to work on COVID recovery metrics. So we basically um, also partner with Ontario MD and we're having them come in, we're teaching our students about data and why data is important um, in terms of figuring out where we should go in our practices. So data is important on an individual level for my cancer screening, for my diabetes screening. And we're using this data, so we're empowering our students to use this data and then go out and be ambassadors with the preceptor they've been paired with to also emphasize why data is important and really use this data to bring patients in who are overdue, for example, for cervical screening or diabetes screening childhood immunizations so students will get the opportunity to work with the preceptor in the community and the preceptor in the community has helped with for example their cervical cancer catch-up because there's a student there to help lend a hand in terms of coordinating the bookings and also then hopefully doing the intervention with their preceptor so that is happening uh, you may have even seen notifications and a call out for preceptors that is happening this upcoming june and we look forward to iterations and scaling this up in the future Ryan, that's just amazing. And you can see from the thumbs up and the hands and the applause that everyone is really happy about this. So we have about 15 minutes left. I'm going to swing things around a little bit. Um, I don't know how many we have on um, in the group. I've lost that number. But I wanted to actually um, maybe ask all of you um, on the panel. So uh, that would be Raj, Ryan, Avnish, Noah, um, to speak to leadership. And, you know, was there an important milestone in your career that got you interested in actually becoming a leader? Because um, we need more leaders in the community. And, and you know, the decision to apply for the position. Um, but I think maybe what started you on your leadership journey, um, I'm just going to take two seconds and be kind of a little selfish. But I have to say that it was the encouragement of a few people, really, at Central DFCM who said, Rosemary, you know, you should kind of do this, or you should maybe invest in yourself and take some leadership courses. And honestly, that's what it took to give me the encouragement to continue. Um, so 
I, I just really think that, you know, people in the audience who say, should I, you know, we all have, um, we all doubt ourselves and our abilities, but there are great people out there to mentor you. And if you have any inkling to get involved at the OHT level, um, at the DFCM leadership, put your hand up and you'd be amazed that someone's going to take that hand and say, yes, please join us. So um, just taking two seconds because, because really that's what started me on my journey. Um, but I'm seeing Raj first, so I'm going to ask Raj to start and then it'll be Ryan, Avnish and then Noah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rosemary. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, for, for me personally, I, I, um, I, I don't really like to um, work in, in systems that, that, that don't work for me and that don't work for my patients. And so I, I think I became a, a leader uh, sort of out of that uh, desire to, to improve things. Um, how, you know, I specifically got into, into digital um was sort of like by accident to be honest i um i did an mba like after i did my my residency and and a part of that was like looking at um some of the problems that we face in primary care and seeing if there were uh potential you know organizational business uh or not for profit solutions and so i ended up joining a, a tech startup after i finished that um which sort of introduced me to tech and i'd never really been in tech before I didn't like major in computer science or I don't actually even really know how to code um, confession but um, yeah so that that's how I got introduced to tech and I started talking to lots of doctors around the province about their experiences and uh, when I joined the department at St. Michael's Hospital I um, I had an opportunity to take on a leadership role for uh, digital health uh, in uh, in our department I can't say that there was a lot of competition uh, for for that role uh, because uh, it's not always the most popular uh, role for not not something everyone's that interested in. But uh, I think, you know, over the years, uh, uh, it's something that I've just kind of grown into and I, I really enjoyed. And, uh, it's nice to have an opportunity to, to interact with uh, frontline providers and also government and also, uh, you know, private industry through through vendors and and uh, even not for profits in some situations. So so that's kind of how I got in. And I, and I really like it. That's wonderful. Thank you. Ryan, could you tell us your story? Thanks, Rosemary. Uh, so for about seven years or so now, I've actually been presenting on behalf of the Ontario Medical Association on billing seminars and practice management throughout the province. So I've been traveling throughout the province lately, webinars, but now back in person. And in addition to being able to actually speak to groups at coffee breaks before, after, you have colleagues who come up to you and physicians and they say, you know, I'm having this issue or what do you think about this? And they just look to you beyond the actual slides, of the presentation, but issues that have come up and you really hear on the ground from across the province, what's going on. And I would always try and offer advice where I could, things that would work for me in my practice, um, things I had suggested, OMA resources, it was an OMA event after all. Um, but when this job posting came up and I thought, wow, this is really interesting, you know, DFCM, Office of Health System Partnership, being able to really work and really um, from kind of a policy level and try and actually affect all these changes that people have been asking about and really seeing the needs out there. So I thought this is really a positive place where I can make a change. And hopefully um, all these small conversations I've had throughout the years, I can take all of that insight and really try and make a difference. Wow, amazing. Um, Avnish? Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, I, I really just started working in leadership positions uh, in the last couple of years, and it really started at my CHC originally, and it was very interesting because uh, it was almost by default because they kind of asked, you know, who wants to take on more of a leadership role, and it was really one of those everybody else step back, and it was just me, And that, but then I really enjoyed it, and I really found that uh, it's an opportunity to uh, to affect change and, uh, and um, uh, really kind of have your voice heard. Uh, working with colleagues, and it, it's a lot of fun. When this role came up for the attachment lead, I got really excited as well, because it, to me, it looked like, all right, there's really an understanding, and it's clear understanding from, from the Department of Family and Community Medicine, how important attachment is going to be in the future. I think they saw it coming down the road. I, I know they did, uh, and uh, and they they really tried to, uh, to try to get ahead of it. So I got very excited about that, and I was really excited to to be working um, with with such a great group who clearly also have uh, very similar uh, very similar interests in, in trying to move uh, move things forward and getting family physician voices heard 
uh, and actually, you know, making some uh, some projects which uh, which can like like Ryan was talking about now, which he's done, which uh, really make a difference for family physicians. So that was uh, that was my excitement to work with uh, with this group. That's wonderful, um, and Nova. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, so for me, the I think the journey begins like before I was in med school. I was actually in business school and literally felt the soul getting sucked out of me. Um, and uh, I sort of put a stop to that and left and went to went to med school. Um, and you know, I think you know the business school training still had some like you know it implanted some stuff in my brain about management and leadership and stuff like that. Um, and sort of a desire, as I said before, to see what kind of, you know, opportunities there could be to have more impact than the, I don't know, 1500 odd patients that might be in my practice. Um, and that's what drove me towards the kind of research that I do. Uh, plus, I would add, it's nice to have some variety in your week. Um, and so, you know, I think getting engaged in this way offers that opportunity, which is really nice. Um, and so I think the other thing I would add is that there's something very specific about the culture of family medicine and the focus on relationships that we are professionalized uh, to having that makes us pretty decent natural leaders. Like everybody has their own style, of course, but like it, you know, you may not think you have any leadership training, but actually you do. And um and, and, you know, you can translate that into something, you know, potentially in, impactful and rewarding, like, you know, with the variation in your week and a sense that you're making a difference in a slightly different way. That's great. Danielle, did I see, was that a hand? Yeah, Rosemary, if you don't mind my uh, jumping the queue and leaping in on that, just Absolutely in hot not. pursuit of what Noah was saying, because I think it's such a great point about variety in your week. And one of the things that I have been reflecting on um, in my role as department chair is that I think I suspect that perhaps part of the um, decision that we're seeing people make across the whole um, range of their careers to uh, move out of comprehensive family medicine and into focus practice is because perhaps we haven't offered people enough opportunities to have that variety in their week and that maybe one of the things that one of the ways that DFCM can contribute to supporting people staying in comprehensive family medicine is to offer them um, intentional like opportunities to switch things up in their week a little bit. And maybe you scale back a little, but you come and do a master's with us, or maybe you scale back a little, but you take on more teaching, um, or maybe you scale back a little, but you take on a leadership role. And so that people don't feel that the only um, option that they've got is to kind of close the door and I'm not you know suggesting that uh, those scale backs are easy to achieve or accomplish and there are a million um, you know components and things to be thought through about it but I think offering people that um, that career refresh that doesn't need to involve totally leaving comprehensive family medicine and that allows people to continue to contribute um, meaningfully to patient care but just through other ways at other levels um, I think is something that we need to think about um, being intentional about the framing of that in our offerings at DFCM, because we do offer all of those things and more, but we don't necessarily always call it a career refresh or a, a you know burnout recovery program or whatever. However, we might um, want to think about uh, those those opportunities for for people's well being and personal growth. Danielle, thank you so much for jumping in, and you're absolutely right. And Catherine, I'm going to call on you in just a sec because we know you're such a seasoned leader, but you know what I'm hearing is is passion, um, the desire to make change, not just at your practice, but an, uh, at a bigger level, and perhaps to make things better for our colleagues, our senior colleagues, colleagues at our career path, and our junior colleagues, and and definitely doing something different that you feel is making a change, and and um, really uh, having people who are very like minded is a career refresh. I can say that personally. Um, it's wonderful. And Catherine, I'm going to pass it over to you. We're doing really great for time. So kudos to everyone on the panel. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add to the wonderful conversation to say that I believe that leadership is actually a wonderful antidote to burnout. That has been the case for me. Um, I, I, I 
uh, I, should, I have the privilege of working in an equity deserving neighborhood on a day to day basis, seeing many newcomers and refugees and um, of late, um, uh, many Afghan refugees, as folks know, have been lined up to be in, um, seen in our clinic and the kinds of barriers that they have gone have been facing, especially with housing crisis and primary care, the access to primary care has been really difficult to um, go through. However, when I translate that to work that I can do, that we can do at health systems leaders it, on the next day that I do mostly admin work, um, you know, we have been able to establish a, a clinic that can um, respond to the 400 people that we had in the wait list and um, get uh, our whole health team partners to come around and, and do the work with us. I mean, that gets me going back into clinic the next day because I think, oh God, okay, it's not just me hearing the stories again. Through my health systems leadership hat, we're actually able to implement these tangible solutions that we're working together in a distributed leadership model to put forward. And, and so I, I do think that when we think about checking out of family medicine, maybe check into leadership instead. Um, that's what I'm gonna leave folks with thinking about as we hopefully end our session earlier today. So I'm just gonna close up, or actually, you know what, Catherine, I don't know who's supposed to close. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but I'm just gonna close, close and thank everyone, everyone for taking the time here. Um, it was just amazing. and. Uh, if there's nothing else to add, maybe we can give back five minutes for a bio break. Um, anyway, if, 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 if I'm going off track, please let me know. I'm totally cool with that too. So thank you. So I just wanted to uh, express my sincere thanks to our, uh, our panel. Um, you have each contributed such uh, interesting reflections and I'm so glad we had the time uh, towards the end to kind of think about uh, individuals' leadership journey. I, I think your team uh, was strategically put together by uh, thinking about uh, 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 making sure we have a broad representation and diverse voices um, uh, coming together, community family physicians, academic physicians, research, uh, et cetera. The, the, um, the more interesting voices in the room uh, the better representation we have for all of our 2000 faculty and all of the uh, additional family physicians outside that uh, that we also um, uh, help to contribute to. And then of course, for our patients as well. Um, before we uh, head off to our workshops, I wanted to thank everyone for joining and sharing this in this amazing showcase of the academic work happening in our department. Uh, we would love your feedback. Uh, please share it when you complete your evaluations, which will arrive by email shortly. Uh, we actually will not be returning back to this link after the workshops. So if for whatever reason you do not have your workshop uh, links, you can go to the website dfcmconference.ca. You'll find all the workshop links there. Uh, please take a couple of minutes uh, for a bio break and then, uh, and then head off to your individual workshop links. And thanks for joining us. Uh, at the DFCM conference this year. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Brian, huge thumbs up. Thank awesome you. Awesome as always. Um, one second.